we've started to see that there are two distinct ways an object can move. If we have an object like this, we could move it up or down along the y-axis, we could move it left or right along the x-axis, or we could move it forward and backward along the z-axis. But in addition to that, an object can rotate or revolve. And in the same way that we saw it could move on the x, y, or z axes, it could rotate about this, the y axis. It could rotate like this way about the x axis. That's its pivot axis now. Or we could let it rotate this way about the z axis. The two different types of motion are called translation and rotation. Translation is the first one. Translation or translational movement. And then the other is rotation. The spinning about some axis. Forces describe translation. Torques are analogous, but instead of translation, they de describe rotation. Translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium, we'll see. Translational equilibrium means the net force, if you add them all up, the net is zero. Rotational equilibrium means something very similar. The net torque is zero. So when we have translational equilibrium, we know that the sum of the left forces is equal to the sum of all the right forces. And likewise, the sum of all the up forces is equal to the sum of all the down forces. We can make similar statements about rotation, except we only have one thing to balance. The sum of the clockwise torques is equal to the sum of the counterclockwise torques. Whenever we balance, we don't put positive 14 newtons and negative 14 newtons for the up and down forces because those two things aren't equal. So there's an implication here. What we're doing, we're implying some absolute values. We don't, uh, we don't typically write those absolute value signs, but you are more than welcome to. The same would be true down here. When you balance, like this, we don't write in the absolute values. And here's the reason. Consider uh, left and right forces. If I have some object and I'm adding up all of the forces, and I've got maybe this one is the applied force, this is the, stat, uh, the static friction or kinetic friction, here's mg, here's the normal force. If I add up, okay, the x forces are fa, and it's positive, plus fk, and it's negative. Well, I've just considered the signs the way I'm supposed to. But if the object is in equilibrium, this whole thing is zero. And when I add fk to both sides, I get this. The left force is equal to the right force. So we're kind of implying these absolute values. You don't plug in the negative sign here. You would plug it in before you moved it to the other side. we can do some problems involving rotational equilibrium. Okay, number one, we've got this 16 kilogram seesaw. It's seven meters long from one end to the other. And it is supported at its center of mass by a wedge. Here's the wedge, so this must be the center of mass. Now, a little tip, the center of mass, that's where the force of gravity acts. So this gravity force is mg, where m is 16, g is 9.81. I'm just going to call it 16g right now. And it's not grams, right? It's, it's 16 times 9.81. All right, we've got a 4 kilogram block hanging 2.5 meters to the left. So here, if we go left, 2.5 meters. The mass here is uh, four, 4 kilograms. So I'm just going to draw a gravity force down, and that gravity force, well, this block is pulling down with its gravity, 
4 times 9.81. It's pulling down with its gravity force on the seesaw. Then we have the question, where must a 7 kilogram mass be placed? So this must be the 7 kilogram mass. So that the seesaw doesn't move. So it doesn't move. That means it's in total equilibrium, or static equilibrium is the fancy term, but it's in rotational equilibrium, the net torque is zero, and it's in translational equilibrium, the net force is zero. And we have to find where to put that seven kilogram mass. Well, clearly we have to put it somewhere on the other side. We do not know this R value, but we know how hard it pulls down. It pulls down with a force of seven, times 9.81. That's not the only, those are not the only forces. We have one more that we haven't drawn. Uh, now the seesaw is what we care about. So we want to draw the forces on the seesaw. This block is pulling down on the seesaw with its gravity. This block is pulling down on, its, on the seesaw with its gravity. And what about the wedge? Well, the wedge is pushing the thing up with some supporting force. We'll call that the normal force. Because we have total equilibrium, or static is the fancy term, which we're not really going to be using, but static equilibri equilibrium, we can balance the torques. We could say the clockwise torques, balance the counterclockwise torques, but we can also balance the forces. So there's only ups and downs, but the up forces have to balance the down forces. Now my drawing's not very uh, well drawn because it's not much to scale, is it? I mean, first of all, that's a bigger force than seven, but I haven't drawn it that way. And second of all, this up arrow has to be, if I took this guy and I moved it to here and I added it and I took this guy and I added it to here, the up force has to be as big as the down force because they balance. So the up force should actually be like some huge, huge arrow like that. And I can take these back away, just they were there for me to make sure my picture was the right size. Uh, but I'm not going to draw a huge up arrow like that. I'll leave it the way I've done it currently. Okay, let's balance the torques. The thing could either pivot like this. You know, that's a clockwise pivoting. Or it could pivot the other way. It could pivot to here and then to here, kind of falling down that side. Well, this force is trying to, here's the pivot, so it's either going to pivot like this or like this. This force tends to pull it clockwise, but the other force tends to pull it counterclockwise. So I've got a clockwise torque, that's force times distance sine of theta, and on the other side I have a counterclockwise torque from this guy, force times distance sine of theta. So again, this is the clockwise torque, and so I have to plug in the force. The force is the gravity force, so 7 times 9.81. The distance from the pivot to this force, we don't know, that's r. The angle between the force and distance, here's the distance arrow, here's the force. That angle is 90 degrees, and the reason is because this thing, the seesaw, is horizontal. On the other side, Again, we plug in the clockwise, the force that's pulling clockwise, that's 4 times 9.81. We plug in the distance from the pivot, 2.5. And we plug in, well, what's the angle between R and force? Again, it's 90 degrees. Now, you might be asking, well, wait a second, you're ignoring two forces. I mean, you've highlighted this force and this force, but what about this one and that one? Don't they produce torque? Shouldn't we balance them in our equation? Well, the answer is actually those two don't produce any torque. The force is not zero, that's not the reason. But look back to the torque equation. How far are those forces from the pivot? Well, the pivot is the fulcrum or the wedge here, what we call the wedge or fulcrum. And gravity is acting at the pivot. The normal force is acting at the pivot. So R is zero. The forces are not zero, but the torque is zero because anything times an R of zero becomes zero.
that's why I, I that's why I ignored them in this equation. Okay, we can actually do some fancy work and cancel out the g's. We divide both sides by g. Sine of 90 is just one, so I'm going to make that. You know, this is all. This is just one. This is just one. And what I have now is 7r equals 4 times 2.5. Well, 2.5 times 4, that's going to be 10. And r is going to be, whoops, let's move this down. r is going to be 10 over 7. We have to always calculate the decimal value. That's 1.43 meters. Part A is done. Where do we put this thing, the seven kilograms? We put it 1.43 meters to the right of the, the wedge. Part B says, what is the upward supporting force on the seesaw? From the wedge on the seesaw, find Fn. Well, we could balance up and down like I started to do before. The up force, there's only one. I should probably put, we're summing up the forces pointing upward. We're summing the forces that point downward. The only force pointing up is Fn. And look, I'm not considering clockwise or counterclockwise. That's what we do for torque. When we're adding forces, we don't care about the torque. We don't care about the rotation. So there's only one thing pointing up. It's this. There are three forces pointing down. The first is 4 times 9.81. The second is 16 times 9.81, and the third is 7 times 9.81. So we calculate this all together, 4 plus 7 plus 16. I'm going to factor out the 9.81 and multiply last, and I get 265 newtons. That's how we solve.